kind of go back um, into this little section that we've been in, and we've been moving down through chapter 1 here of Ephesians, really uh, in no particular reason except that we got through the first 14 verses, and, well, there's a few more verses to go, so let's just look at those as well. And we introduced this, the, the, the section last time, verse 15, Wherefore I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus, and love unto all the saints, cease not to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. The eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that ye may know what is the hope of his calling and what the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints, and what is the exceeding greatness of his power to usward, who believed according to the working of his mighty power, which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places. We Again, we've been looking at this chapter. We started in verse 3 and went down through the all spiritual blessings and, and the things that the Godhead are doing in your life and how the Father ha is, has instituted to do some things. If you look there at verse number 4, he says, according as he had chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be. And then, they, then he begins a whole list of things that he's going to give to us, that he has given to us, and who we are in Christ. Then he came, comes in and he says, and oh, by the way, because you are in Christ, this is what I'm doing for you because you are in Christ. And he, some more information. And then he says, and oh, by the way, I'm going to use the Holy Spirit to do this. And we went through all of that wonderful information. And last time we began this section and I tried to give you our tomorrow in review. And we looked over and we went down through this in an in a overview. And I just want to go back now and begin to maybe pick up some some items here. In verse 16, obviously Paul is praying for them. I cease not to make... <clears throat> Cease not to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers. And he begins to lay out here, in, in really not, not Paul's first prayer that he ever made, but in a prayer that Paul, through the Holy Spirit, through Paul, begins to show you how and what the Godhead thinks and prays about and is concerned with. And you know, all of these, there's five of them where Paul does this. Two in Ephesians, two in Philippians, and one in Colossians. And, and again, Paul prays constantly for everybody. He doesn't just, all right, these are only five times I'm praying. And prayer is not a posture. 1 Thessalonians 5, he says, pray without ceasing. Well, if, the, if, the, if prayer was a posture, you would never get up. Then eventually you would die because you're going to run out of water and food. Okay? So prayer isn't a posture. Prayer is just simply talking to the Father about the details of life, talking to the Father about His Word and how to apply it to, to what's going on in life. And so Paul begins here in verse 17, and he says, Hey guys, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, boy, what a title. Now this is God the Father. He's the Father of glory. It's the glory plan that He developed, that He has. And Paul says, I pray what I'm thinking about you guys, and when I think about you, this is what I would love to have, that he may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. Now, by the way, when he talks there about giving you the spirit of wisdom and revelation, he's not talking about giving you the Holy Spirit again. We've already, we already have him in verse 13 and 14. We already have the spirit. So this isn't a, this isn't a double dose of the Holy Ghost, okay? All right. This is a this is something different. By the way, in, in verse eight, wherein he hath abounded toward us, and how much wisdom and prudence, all of it. He's given all this information to us. He's made it known to us. And what Paul now wants to happen is for that that wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of him to now come into your life and have an impact and have the impact that it's designed to have. He's already given you all of it. God has made known to us, there in verse 9, having made known unto us the mystery of His will. There is no mystery of His will anymore. 
It's all been revealed. It's all there. He's made known to us everything. And Paul's prayer is that all this truth and doctrine and information would come in and have an impact on your life. And because it's designed to have an impact in life. Too often, many times, we, we get saved and we're talking about fire insurance, you know. That's a great way to think about it. We're, whew, we're saved from hell, we don't have to go. But it's much more than that, isn't it? As we begin to look here at some things that every adult needs to know, in the passage here in verse 17 and 18 and 19, there's some things that you and I ought to have on our heart and to know because this information is designed to have an impact in your life. And it's much more than having fire insurance from the lake of fire. By the way, that is a great deal. That's a good thing. But Calvary covers all of that, but it also covers so much more. And Paul says, man, what, you just went through all this amazing doctrine about all the spiritual blessings you have in Christ. Who are you in Christ? I'm holy. I'm without blame. I'm accepted. I've been forgiven. I have the riches of His grace given to me. I have all of this. Take all of that now and let's allow it to impact your life. Because the impact is going to be, verse 18, that the, eye, that the eyes of your understanding being, what? Enlightened. Have the light bulbs come on. Too many times I think we walk around in our Christian life as if God doesn't care how you live your life. He does care how you live your life. And the reason He cares is because He has a life for you to live. You understand that. Hold on to here real quick, just in case. 2 Corinthians 5. Not that in case you don't understand that, but I'll show you the verse. Okay? Often, I was talking with some folks this past week. They're from out of state, and they had a loved one pass away. They're believers. He's a believer. And they're like, hey, can you come and do the memorial service here on 1st of March? I'm like, sure. I don't know you guys from from uh, anything except the, the name is familiar and you know they're out of uh, uh, John Versagan and, Brent and, and so forth so I'm like okay at least half half of the questions are good <laughs> we'll get to the other side you know later so I get to talking to him and this young man he committed suicide you know what you know what happens when you commit suicide you woke up that morning and you made a very bad decision that's what happened and everybody gets all upset. And, well, is he going to heaven? He's going to heaven, folks. He's a saved man, had a clear testimony, just had a bad day. You ever have a bad day? I don't. I have great days. <laughs> and I'm a liar, too, aren't I? <laughs> if you don't believe me, just ask her. She's sitting right over there, okay? <laughs> but see, the thing is, is when you live your life, there, God has a design for it. And he says, I want that your eyes of your understanding be what? Enlightened. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 14, For the love of Christ constraineth us, because we thus judge that if one died for all, then we're all dead. Amen? And that he died for all. Amen again. But why did he die? Notice what the next word is. That, the intent, the purpose, the reason that he died for all was so that nobody would spend eternity in the lake of fire. That's not what that verse says, is it? That, they which live. That means if you were dead and everybody's dead and now you're living, what has he given to you? Life. He gave you, Romans 6, the newness of life. Which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. You see, folks, your focus, come back to Ephesians 1, your focus should be living for him. Don't ever think, now by the way, you weren't saved based on how you were living. You don't stay saved based on how you're living. You were saved because you trusted in him and Christ, and you stay saved because you trusted him in Christ. Okay? But when he says here in verse 18 that the eyes of your understanding 
being light enlightened, the doctrine is designed to produce an enlightened inner man. Have the lights come on. Today, I, I, I watch and follow several of uh, motivational speakers, coaches, give me your money. I follow, I follow the free side, okay? <laughs> All right? All right, and if you're one of those, I'm sure that you're good and, and everything, but I, I don't need that. You know why? I have this, okay? In the motivational little ditties that come across Facebook, I have those, so I'm good to go, you know? <laughs> rah, 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 right? Stephen Wright said, you know who Stephen Wright is? The comedian, deadpan. One time he says, I worked at a fire hydrant factory. I couldn't park anywhere near the building. I love those. I got a list of them. I got a long list of them. Okay, but seriously, folks. No, don't call me Shirley. <laughs> See, folks, you can have fun with life, but the doctrine, Paul says, I, I pray that this, the doctrine that you just learned about who you are in Christ would come in and enlighten, turn the light bulbs on. And how he does it, he, he goes, I, I want, I pray that we would have this intimate relationship with the Father. So much so that the focus, look at verse 18, that we may, what's that word? No, that the, our intimate relationship with the Father, because this is who we're talking about, the Father of glory. Paul says, I pray that the Father of our Lord, the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, that he would come in and have an intimate relationship in your life, in your inner man, and that you would know him, and the focus would be on him. Notice it's to know his calling, isn't it? And what is the hope of his calling, and what the riches of the glory of his inheritance is in the saints, verse 19, and what is the exceeding greatness of his power? See the his, his calling, his inheritance, his power. Not you. The focus is on him. We, boy, we love focusing on us, don't we? Oh, man, can we get the party started? We get focused on ourselves so much so in our prayer life. You know what we start doing? We start arguing with God and what he ought to be giving us. I did this, and boy, Lord, you know what? I really need that Cadillac. No, I'm, no, I'm driving the Chevy, but I need the Cadillac. And if you, God, if you love me, you're going to give me the And we start fighting with God about stupid stuff. Paul says, I don't need that. You don't need that. Well, I want you to be enlightened to know him. This isn't about yourself. Man left to himself is very selfish. Very selfish. Paul says, no, this isn't about you. I want, I'm praying that he would come along, the doctrine would come along, I should say, and enlighten you. He's to fill our thinking. And what he's going to fill our thinking with is some wisdom and some revelation and some knowledge and some understanding and some prudence and some things out of the Word of God that impacts our life on a daily basis. Because the focus of our daily life is on him. Well, Rick, i got to go to that job. So, how do I go to the job? Look at chapter 6 of Ephesians. I moved I went I have moved back to Mesa Public Schools. I left Chandler and I moved back up here get closer to home, get off the year-round tormental schedule. By the way, if they ever want to go year-round in your district, fight it with everything you have. Okay? I'm just I can give you the details later. Right now is not the time. When I moved back up, I took a pay cut, a pay cut. Have to. You got to move, you know, blah blah blah. You know what Linda and I did? We boohooed for about 30 seconds till we could figure out what we were going to do with our budget and made some changes and this and that. But you know what? When I go to the job, I don't walk in there and go, doggone it, you guys don't pay me enough. 
you should be paying me, man. I've been doing this for 10 years now. Wait, wait, wait. I don't go in there with that attitude, because what happens when you go in with that attitude? You're on the bread line now again. But look at what you would, the attitude to have going into the job. Ephesians 6, verse 5. Servants, be obedient to them that are your masters according to the flesh with hatred, anger, wrath, lousy disposition, cussing them out every time you get. No, with fear and trembling and singleness of your heart as unto the paycheck. Oh, no. As unto retirement. As unto who? Christ. Not with eye service. I love that. How do you work your job when the boss ain't looking? Yeah, you better be. But if he ain't looking, what are you doing? Ah, I'm on break. As men pleasers but as the servants of Christ doing the will of God from where? Now notice we're in Ephesians 6. and Go back to Ephesians 1. What's he done to you in Ephesians 1? Take this doctrine of who you are in Christ, put it into the details of life because it's going to make an impact on your daily life as you bring that into your thinking. Have you ever had a lousy co-worker? Nah, not, never, right? Okay. How do you deal with that lousy co-worker? You're, you guys are co-workers, not boss, not boss, okay? How do you deal with them? Stick them in the back, you do this, you must. No, what do you do? You go in and you start practicing the doctrine, don't you? As much as lieth in me to live peaceably with all men, I do not need to see you. <laughs> so I ain't seeing you, okay? Why? Or what do you do? You go over there and say, you know what? Christ, if you want to really make them mad, give them the gospel. I did that one time. Had a had a bus driver upset with me about something I didn't even know I did. And she came at me, guns blazing. You know me. I, I just stood there, let her get it out, and I just said, you know what? I'm sorry, but Christ died for you. And you know what she did? I said, Christ died for you. Then I'm in the office now because I offended her. She never talked to me again. So it was a great thing. It was a wonderful thing. <laughs> it did. That day it did. What's the deal here? You're back in Ephesians 1, 18. I, I want you to be enlightened. I want you to know some the wisdom and the revelation and the prudence and the understanding. All of that is designed to do what? Focus on Him, to know Him. We just sang the song, didn't we? I had James sing that song on a, pur on re on a purpose. What does it say? Turn your eyes upon who? Jesus. Look fully. I had to save it because I'd never remember it. Look fully in His wonderful face. Why? And the things of this earth will grow strangely brighter and harder. No, they do what? They grow dimly. Where? In the light of His glorious grace. Folks, that's a mindset. That's a thinking process. Paul says, folks, I want you to turn your eyes upon Jesus. The details of life stink. Life is tough. If nobody's told you that yet. I tell my kids on the bus that all the time. Little Johnny picked on me. Deal with it. Life's tough. If I don't see it, you're not, you know, it's not a bully situation. I gotta be PC now, okay? In case somebody's listening. Deal with it. Toughen up, buttercup. Let's go. You see what happens is is life for you and I as believers now. That's what Paul's dealing with here. He's like, guys, life. And where I want you to be enlightened is, is in Him, and it's to focus in Him. And when you focus in Him, and you get to know His calling, and you get to know His riches, and you get to know His power, then you begin to delight in what He delights in. And you know what? When you begin to delight in what the Father delights in, now you are an adult. And that is what your sonship issue in Christ is all about, and that is delighting in what the Father delights in. We looked last time in Jeremiah. Where he comes in and he says, hey, delight in what I delight in. 
You see, folks, just because God claims you to, and, and, and the Father looks at you as an adult in his family doesn't mean you act like it. What do you have to do? You've got to grow into that maturity. You've got to grow up. And so he begins to lay out some things here that every adult needs to know. And when you know these, and the wisdom and the revelation is going to come in and enlighten your understanding, and when that happens, you begin to delight in the things that the Father delights in. And you know what? You quit worrying about work. And you quit worrying about the co-worker. Because you've got verses that tell you how to deal with those guys. And then yet you focus on who you are in Christ and what He's doing. The goal of the wisdom and revelation is to take these things in verse 18 and 19 and put them into your understanding. When you understand something, then you get to know the Father. And he says, I want you to know some things about him. To know. Verse 18, that you may know. I've said it before. You've heard other preachers say it. Your Christian life will not operate on the basis of ignorance. You are to know some things. Your Christian life will not be operate on the basis of emotions or on the basis of religious tradition. Your Christian life will not operate on the basis of scholarship where we've been to the right seminaries and cemeteries and got all the degrees and all that stuff. Your Christian life doesn't operate that way, I'm sorry. Your Christian life operates when you have some understanding and some knowledge and some wisdom. And your, op your Christian life operates when you begin to focus on knowing Him. There are three things here in this passage that you need to know as an adult. We're to know the hope of His calling and what the riches of the glory of His inheritance in the saints and what is the exceeding greatness of His power. And when you begin to look at these three issues that point up here, the hope of His calling. Wow. Come over to chapter 4, if you will. In Scripture, calling is an interesting thing when you talk about calling. Look at 4.1. I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith ye are called. Folks, we're called. And we have a job that's associated with the calling that we have. So then the question is, is then what's the calling? Well, look over at chapter 2 and verse 10. Chapter 2.10. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus, unto good works, which God hath before ordained. So the before there would be where? Before the foundation of the world, ordained that we should walk in them. Folks, God, before the world began, before he formed the body of Christ with people, he had a plan for the body of Christ to live in and to function in, and it's called good works. And your vocation is to go out there and to do the good works. That's why I said a minute ago, he's interested in how you live your life. Because he has a plan for you to live in, and it's based on who you are in Christ. That's why it is Paul in Ephesians 5, that begins to deal with husbands and wives, children, parents, the work relationship. That's why in Revelation 12, he will begin to help you deal with how to handle those that are without and those that are within. Those that are sitting right here in the, in the, in the local assembly, and then your neighbors on the outside that are unsaved who become enemies and so forth. That's why you have those descriptions. Why? Because God is concerned in how you live because He's got a calling for you. <laughs> That's a great thing. Come over with me to 2 Timothy chapter 1. 
So, folks, he's interested in how you live. So when, when life gets in a turmoil and things get to be a little rocky, God says, I've got the prescription to fix that. You just got to focus on the right area. It's interesting, the marriage seminar, we're going to do that, and, you know, obviously thinking about it and getting... One of the leading causes of marriages to break up, you know what it is? Sin. Surprise, surprise, surprise. The sin of pride. The sin of selfishness. The sin of uh, esteeming myself better than the other. You Think about that. If you're believers, you've got Christ in you. You've got the Holy Spirit in you. They've got the Christ in them. They've got the Holy Spirit in them. And you guys are barking at each other. That doesn't make much sense, does it? Why? Why does that happen? Because we begin to focus on who? Me. I'm not focusing on who I am in Christ or who the other is in Christ. It's interesting. The statistics are phenomenal. Not really. First, 2 Timothy 1, verse 9. Who has saved us? In verse 8 there, be, be not uh, thou ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me as prisoner, but be thou partakers of the afflictions of the gospel according to the power of God, who hath saved us and called us with a holy calling. Look, look at that, a holy calling. Not according to our works, but according to his own purpose. Folks, you're called, the vocation wherewith you're called, not according to you, but according to what? His purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus when you got saved. Ah, uh, no, that's not what that verse said, is it? Before when? Before the world began. Why? Because in Ephesians... <laughs> uh, sorry. Ephesians 1. Ephesians 1. <laughs> Ephesians, Ephesians 1, verse 4. That's okay. Break it up a little bit. That's okay. <laughs> Ephesians 1 verse 4, According as, you ha as he had chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestinated us under the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will. When did he, when did he call you? Before the foundation of the world. By the way, notice verse 4 very carefully. According as he hath chosen us to be in him. Doesn't say that. That's the Calvinistic thinking. That's the Calvinistic doctrine of you. You've got to be one of the elect. And before the foundation of the world, God moved heaven and earth to make it so. No. He chose you to be where? In him. How do we get in him? Come over to 1 Corinthians 1, verse 21. Real quick here. Time's slipping away and i got four more pages. 1 Corinthians 1, 21. For after that, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God, it pleased God. The sovereign free will of God, if you need the big words, the sovereign free will of God was to do what? It pleased God to say, by the foolishness of preaching, to save them that what? Believe. You, Paul tells the Thessalonians, you were called by my gospel. That's how you got saved. You heard the gospel of your salvation, the word of truth, Ephesians 1.13, you believed it, you trusted in it, and the moment you trusted him, he said, here was what I've chosen before the foundation of the world to do, and that's to give you a calling to go out there and live as who you are in me, in my son. And when you do that, and when you are that way, that's what Paul's praying for. I mean, I pray that you would know the hope of his calling. He's got a plan for you. Come to Colossians 1. He's got a plan for the body of Christ that he set up way back there before the world began. And he said, if you trust in my son and you believe the power of the gospel of Christ and you trust that, then I got a plan for you and you're a part of it and you need to know about it. We're in a little advanced doctrine. We're not in Romans anymore. Ephesians I'm sorry, Colossians 1, verse 16. Here it is. 
For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created by him and for him, and he is before all things, and by him all things consist. What are the all things in the verses? Well, it's the green grass and the pretty trees and the blue sky and the fluffy clouds. No, who is it? What is it? Principalities, thrones, dominions, government. You know what a throne is? You know what a dominion is? You know what a prince is? You, you, you understand that. And you know what? They were all created by him and what? For him. Now the him here is Christ. The image of, back up there in, in verse 15, who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. And that's his dear son. Colossians 1, 16, we're in verse 18 now. And he, Christ, is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. Paul, over there in 1 Timothy 6, calls him the only potentate. Boy, he's the cat's meow. He's the top dog. There's no one bigger than him. Potentate, that's a, boy, that's a good word. He has a preeminence, but where does he have the preeminence in? In all things, in the government. Folks, the Father's calling is designed to, go back to Ephesians 1. Well, you know what, on, uh, yeah, on the way you get Philippians 3. It's designed for you and I to participate in completely and totally. What did Ephesians 1, 9, and 10 tell us? that the will of the Father was out there in the dispensation of the fullness of time to gather it all back under His headship, didn't it? You and I participate in the hope of His calling. The hope of His calling. His calling to fill up the government of the universe out there. You and I participate in it 100%. We don't lack it. That's why it's the hope of His calling. Look at Philippians 3, verse 20 and 21. For our conversation is in heaven, for whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall change our vile body. Over there in Romans 8, verse 28, he's going to conform you to the image of his dear Son. Romans 8 isn't talking about in time on a daily basis. Romans 8, 28 and following is talking about the future. It's talking about this event right here. Now, in time, he is conforming you to the, to the image of his dear Son. But out there in the future, when we are called home, when our vile body is changed, you know what we begin to do? Now, we don't look like Jesus, and then we all walk around with the, you know, <laughs> Song of Solomon description. But what do we do? We're fashioned like unto his what? Glorious body. We are a complete representation of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, keep reading that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body, according to the working whereby he is able to subdue all things. What would the all things be? The government. You and I, folks, we participate in his calling. But you need to understand what is his calling. His calling before the foundation of the world is to take those who believe, who hear the gospel, believe the gospel, place them into the body of Christ through the baptism of the Holy Spirit, place them into a position of rank and authority out there in the heavenly places so that he can then gather everything back under the headship of his Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And he says, that is the hope. Boy, what a great hope to have. Hope is an interesting thing. Come over to Hebrews 6. Hope in Paul's epistles, every time Paul, I shouldn't say every time because somebody will find a verse, I know, but for the most of the places, hope in Paul's epistles is talking about the future out there in the heavenly places. Hebrews 6, verse number 19 is a great definition of hope. Hebrews 6, 19, which hope we have as a what? Anchor of the soul, both sure and Steadfast. 
and which entereth into that within the veil. Notice the first part of that verse. We have a hope that does what? Anchors the soul, and it's sure and steadfast. Hope, that that expectation of a future event. Folks, if God said, I'm going to do this with the body of Christ, then what do you think He's going to do? He's going to do it. By the way, that's His power. We'll get to it here, hopefully, in a minute. No matter what's going on in life, you're fighting. One of the brothers just said he's been remodeling. So you're fighting with a jackhammer. Fighting with the neighbors, fighting with your spouse, your children. Work. Maybe you don't do that. Maybe you're retired and everything's sunny. And golden. Those golden years. You've seen the little things on Facebook about when I was little, I wanted to grow up, and now I wish I didn't grow up. (laughs) Okay? No matter what's going on in life, you know what you're to know? Ephesians 1.18, the hope of His calling. You see, folks, you have a purpose in life. I know you look around the world and it doesn't look like you much good's going on. But you have a purpose. You're here. You have a purpose in life. And that purpose in life is to be who you are in Christ. And the circumcision and the, the circumstances and the details of life. No matter what's going on, your job is to be who you are. Be all you can be. Ephesians 1.18 And... Next, number number two, no matter what's going on in life, folks, know the hope of His calling. Know that the Father of glory has a plan for you, and you participate in it, and it's something bigger than you. I know in the moment we think we're all that, but you're focusing on the wrong place. You have to focus on who you are in Christ. You have to focus on Him. And what the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. Now everybody on that phrase focuses on what? His inheritance in the saints. My, but may I just tell you that that is not the next thing that you're to know, because you know that in his calling. His calling is his inheritance in the saints. That's his calling. And we know that, don't we? We understand that. But what are we? what's the second issue? And we're to know what is the riches of the glory. That's what you're to know. It's more than just knowing his inheritance. That's a piece of his coming. I mean, sorry, his calling. What is his calling? To set the body of Christ up as the government uh, agency uh, in heavenly places, right? Where does he put that on display? Look down in verse number 21. Well, verse 22. And hath put all things under his feet and gave him to be head over all things. Again, the government to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. The hope of his calling is to fill up the government with the body of Christ. And his inheritance is what? To fill up the government with the body of Christ, the saints. So we know that, but what's the next thing to know? What is the riches and the glory? The riches of the glory. Folks, know the wealth of it all. You're to see the riches of how valuable you are to the Father. Man, let that sink in. Let that get a hold of your thinking. And I know every guy, everybody argues about the inheritance and the and this and that, and they just run. But you're missing the point here. The point is, is Paul ain't arguing. Paul says as part of your spiritual blessings and who you are in Christ, you've obtained an inheritance, and the reward of that inheritance is a governmental position that you get out there. And then he has an inheritance, you're joint heirs with Christ, and that inheritance that he has, you have because you're in him and he's in you. And Okay, that's pretty simple, I would think. But man, as an adult, grasp a hold to the wealth, the riches. Come over with me to Acts 20. <clears throat> Acts 20. Because you are very valuable 
to the Father. Acts 20:28. 20, Paul is talking to the elders at Ephesus, and he says to them, Take heed, therefore, unto yourselves and to all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers, to feed the church of God, which he hath purchased with his own blood. How valuable are you? The Father is always for you. He's always on your side because it cost him his own blood. That's the riches of the glory that he has in you. Let that sink in. And you know what really quick happens? All the oh, the garbage of life doesn't make nothing. They grow strangely dim. Look full upon. See, I told you, I'd forget it. Turn your eye, look full in his wonderful play, and all and the things of this earth grow strangely dim. The value, the riches, he's for you. He's in your corner all the time. That's fantastic. We you know what? When the father looks at you. And I know what we do. Man, we go, boy, I laid a bummer there, man. I really messed up, you know. And you know what the Father says? I'm for you. I evaluate you on the basis of who you are in my son, not in who you are in you. Because in you, you're a loser. But in my son, you are a winner. Biggest loser and the biggest winner. And he says, what I want you to know is this doctrine. I want you to understand the hope of his calling. See what he's got going on for us today? His inheritance in you. See that. See how he's going to use us to accomplish his program. But then I want to see his, I want you to see his wealth and what you mean to him. So much so that he bought you with your, his own blood. What know you not? You're not your own. You've been bought with a price. The riches of the glory. Folks, you are so wealthy that it's just unreal. Over there in Revelation and in the, in the sayings, the messages to the churches, he looks at him and he says, Though you are poor, yet you are rich. Boy, they look at you guys. You can't buy, sell nothing. You can't do this. You can't feed your family. They think you're poor and dirt. But you know what? Because you've been true to the doctrine, you're richer than rich could ever be. You're richy rich. Paul's saying the same thing. Every adult should understand the hope of his calling, but every adult should understand the wealth and what you mean to the Father. And then in verse 19, the third one, and we'll pick up on more of this next time, and what is the exceeding greatness, by the way, that doesn't mean I'm done, okay? <laughs> All right, sorry. The eyes rolled on the back row back there, okay? Not really. I, I just, you got to say a row instead of saying, well, the fifth row from the front, and everybody's counting now. The back row is easy. Yeah, <laughs> see, she's counting. And the third, the third issue, and what is the exceeding greatness of his power? To us word who believe according to the working of his mighty power. Boy, notice the descriptions of his power. Exceeding, greatness, mighty. And the issue here of, of the power. He's then going to illustrate it for us in verse 20 in two ways. First, he says, which when he wrought in Christ, when he raised him from the dead. You want to see the power of God? Look at the resurrection. There it is. And not only do you look there, but also when he set him at his own right hand in heavenly places. We have a new standard to measure the power of God now. 
In Israel's program, by the way, you know how they measured the power of God? Every time they would go back and say, hey, you want to see the power of God? You know where they went to? The exodus out of Egypt. When he, when they put the blood on the blood post for the, for the death angel to go over. So he delivered them by blood, but then by power when they crossed the Red Sea. And he looks at them and says, Israel, see your salvation as he deals with Pharaoh and, and everything. Now Paul says, we got us a new standard to see the power. And it's the resurrection from the dead. Do you know why the resurrection of the dead is going to be, demonstrate him to be and his power? Because when he's up from the grave, he's what? Risen. What did they say when the ladies came? He's not here for he is risen. He's a living God. He's not a dead God. You want to see the power of God is the fact that He's alive. He was, He was not, and He is. He's here. He's alive. And took Him up there and set Him down. I love that set. He didn't sit down. Set it. He took Him and He says, you belong right there. Linda and Emily were doing a puzzle till O Dark 30 this morning, and they were setting the pieces in the place. And when he set him at his own at his right hand, own right hand in heavenly places, what that is demonstrating, and we'll see some more of this as well, is the fact that he's going to do what he said he was going to do. And what did the will of the Father say he was going to do? He's going to repossess the heavenly government with the body of Christ and set them in their place with Christ as the head. Then he's going to take the nation of Israel, set her into the earth and the government of the earth with Jesus Christ as their head, their king. And he says, by setting him where he belongs, guess what? I'm going to do it. Chapter 2, verse 7, when we see what he's going to do with us and what that means to him, the hope of his calling and his, the riches, then we see, verse 7, that in the age, 2, 7, that in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness towards us through Christ Jesus. How much strength do you need, folks? How much do you really need to get through? He's given you everything. He's your resource. You don't need... John Maxwell, motivational speaker. You don't need Brian Tracy, motivational speaker. You don't need Daryl Hardy, motivational speaker. You don't need positive power thinking process by Dr. So-and-so. You know who you need? You need to focus your inner man on who you are in Christ. He's your resource. He's your strength. Romans 1. And we'll be done. Well, yeah, we'll be done. Romans 1, verse 16. Romans 1, 16. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth and to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Folks, you need your sins forgiven. You know where they're forgiven? The gospel of Christ forgives them. The power of God. The only way you can ever have your sins forgiven is because of the power of God. He's on your side. You come over to Romans 15. Get the next. Well, you're saved. What about the rest of your days? How about Romans 15, verse number 13? 15, 13. Now the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in what? Believing. Oh, wow. That ye may abound in what? Hope. Hope. Through the power of who? The Holy Ghost. Boy, look at verse 13 closely. You want to have hope for the future? 
And peace in the presence, you know where you're going to have it in that verse right there? You're going to have it in the power of the Holy Ghost. And where does the Holy Ghost work? He works in your inner man. He's going to strengthen your inner man. That's what the prayer in chapter 3 of Ephesians is all about. And where does the, how does the Holy Ghost work in your inner man? How does He strengthen your inner man? How does He come in and fortify your inner man? Romans 12 verse 2 says, By the renewing of your mind. Ephesians 4 will tell you that you're to renew, be renewed in the spirit of your mind. You're to take in the Word of God. The Holy Spirit works with the Word of God. And when the Word of God is in your inner man and the Holy Spirit works with your inner man, guess what you're going to have? Peace. And you're going to have hope. And Paul says all of that is based upon who you are in Christ. Because as adults, Ephesians 1, we're to know some things, aren't we? And therefore, when you know it, what do you do? You set your affections on things above. You seek them out, you learn them, you get them in you, and then you go set that as your mindset. As you stand at the stove and cook dinner, the backyard cleaning up after the dogs, picking oranges off the orange tree or grapefruit, floating down Canyon Lake on the pontoon boat, camping up in the mountains, playing baseball, hockey, football, soccer, whatever you do. You're to do it with who you are and as who you are in Christ. He's richly given us all things to enjoy. That isn't a license to go live any way you want, by the way. That is a license that in your life you remember who you are and where you're at. And Paul says, man, every, uh, things, every, three things that every adult needs to know. You need to know him. And to know him and to delight in him and to delight in what he delights in is to know the hope of his calling and to know the wealth that he thinks about in you and values in you and the power, the strength that he comes along and fortifies you with because you're in his son. I don't know about you, but when that grips your heart, then life gets a little bit easier to handle because I'm not focusing on me. I'm focusing on Him. And that's been the whole goal since chap in chapter 1. Isn't it? That's the whole goal. Now, we're going to pick up, look at some more things in 19, 20, and 21, 22, 23. We're going to see the real Star Wars we're going to see the real things that are going on out there. Because, folks, you're, hope in believing. Romans 15, 13, great verse. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the morning, Lord. We thank you for the time in the Scriptures that we can have one with another. For the moment to let us think about and let us delight in what you think about and delight in. And learn about that. And Lord, I just pray for the folks here that as we do go day to day in life, as, as difficult as life is because we make it difficult or because that's just how life is for us, that we would do so with that hope and that assurance and that anchor to our soul, that when you look at us and you evaluate us, you evaluate us based on who we are in your Son. And we thank you for that. In your name we pray. Amen.